Mount Rainier is one of the snowiest places on Earth. On average, the Paradise area of Mount Rainier National Park receives 540 inches of snow per year. That's over 53 feet, enough to reach one-tenth of the way up Seattle's iconic Space Needle just nearby. That's nothing compared to the winter of 1971-72, though. During a particularly snowy year, Paradise received 1,122 inches of snow, more than 93 feet. The snowfalls here at Mount Rainier are legendary, and in this video, I want to tell you why. This video comes to you by way of Parker Webb 3470. Thank you, Parker, for writing in. Now, I often cover national park superlatives like this here on the channel. And often when I cover them, the reasons behind them are very rarely, if ever, the result of a single factor, one thing that explains their superbness. Usually there's a crazy mix of factors involving geology, geography, and climate that all combine to produce the record-breaking displays of nature that so often are protected in our national parks. And Mount Rainier is no different. Its prodigious snowfall is the result of three main factors. One, proximity to moisture, two, the jet stream, and three, a fancy sounding process called orographic lift that sounds way more complicated than it actually is. First, let's talk about the proximity to moisture. As the crow flies, Mount Rainier is just over 100 miles from the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is, unsurprisingly, a significant source of moisture. And if you want to have precipitation, like snow, you're gonna need moisture. Being so close to the Pacific Ocean means right off the bat, Mount Rainier has a significant advantage over, say, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. The Rockies also do receive a significant amount of snowfall, don't get me wrong, they're just much farther away from the Pacific Ocean, meaning that moisture-laden clouds have to travel that much further to deposit that sweet, sweet powder. So that's factor number one. Mount Rainier is just closer to the thing that provides the snow, the moisture-laden waters of the Pacific Ocean. Which brings us to factor number two, the jet stream, the thing that gets the moisture to the mountains. The jet stream is a complicated and powerful meteorological phenomenon, but basically what it is is it's formed at the boundary point between warmer tropical air moving north and colder polar air moving south. The spin of the earth provides a lateral component to this movement, causing this high-speed superhighway of air to circulate from west to east between six and eight miles above the temperate latitudes of our planet. There are also multiple jet streams, all formed in similar ways, but operating in different areas. The one we're concerned with for this video in Mount Rainier's prodigious snowfall is called the polar jet stream. But this is the climate, right? And this is a natural phenomenon. So the jet stream doesn't take this idealized, perfectly circular route around the Earth. There are localized disturbances and interactions with other meteorological processes that cause it to have this sort of wavy route with dips and troughs as it makes its way around the planet. Those polar vortexes you've probably heard about are a result of the jet stream dipping way down into the southern United States, bringing all that cold polar air with it. In the case of Mount Rainier though, and indeed the Pacific Northwest as a whole, it kind of lies like right in the typical path of one of these dips in the jet stream. Yes, there are variations in this, like I said, sometimes it dips further south, sometimes further north, but by and large, big picture on average, the polar jet stream moves right over the Pacific Northwest and Mount Rainier. Which means this area is in a prime position to receive all that moisture coming on shore from the Pacific Ocean. Storms that form out there in the North Pacific get caught up in the jet stream, and like a high-speed racetrack, it throws them right into the Pacific Northwest, right into Mount Rainier, where it deposits hundreds of inches of snow every single year. So, those are the first two factors. And so far, we've been talking about things that apply to Mount Rainier, 
but which really occur on a landscape scale, on a regional level. Like all of the Cascade Range is close to the Pacific Ocean and primed to receive its moisture. And most of the Cascade Range lies within the average path of the jet stream, meaning they receive a lot of the moisture that it throws at them. For these reasons, the Cascades in general, as a region, are one of the snowiest places on Earth. But what sets Mount Rainier apart? What makes it the snowiest place in the already snowiest region on Earth? The answer to that is our third factor, orographic lift. That fancy sounding term that actually has a fairly simple explanation. If you've ever heard of the rain shadow effect, which I've actually talked about on this channel before, this is basically the flip side of that, the first part of it. Here's how it works. When all that moisture from the Pacific Ocean is brought on shore by the jet stream, one of the first obstacles it hits is the Cascade Range. As that moisture-rich air collides with these giant mountains, it's forced upward, it has nowhere else to go, and that air begins to cool. The higher into the atmosphere you go, the colder it gets. Now, cool air though, isn't as capable of holding as much moisture as warm air. So these air masses continue to climb up the mountains, they become less and less capable of holding onto their moisture. Eventually, the air becomes completely saturated and releases its moisture in the form of snow on the slopes of the Cascades. The flip side of this is the rain shadow effect, where all the moisture is deposited on one side of the mountains, thus leaving a dry and arid environment on the other, hence why eastern Washington and Oregon are deserts. But here again, this is a phenomenon that applies to all of the Cascade Range. All of these mountains are pretty tall, and all of them are subjected to orographic lift-induced snowfall on their western flanks. What makes Mount Rainier so special? Well, it's just really tall. Mount Rainier is the tallest mountain in the Cascade Range at 14,409 feet, but it's also the tallest thing, like by a lot, in its immediate neighborhood. Orographic lift is more pronounced the higher you go in elevation, up to a certain point, and so just by virtue of being really tall, Mount Rainier generates a lot of snowfall due to this effect. And also, it's a relatively straight shot from the ocean and that moisture to Mount Rainier. There aren't that many obstructions, like the coastal mountains of Oregon and California, that can intercept these moisture-laden storms first, sort of like a smaller scale version of what happens with the Cascades and the Rockies. The storms and snowfall have a clear runway right to the high elevation slopes of Mount Rainier, depositing truly legendary amounts of snowfall. And to be clear, the rest of the Cascades also still receive a lot of snow, hundreds of inches in most cases. Mount Baker even eclipsed Mount Rainier for the single season snow record during the winter of 1998-99, when it received 1,140 inches of snow, 95 feet. But we're talking about average conditions here, and for that, Mount Rainier still stands tall, quite literally. This is also the point where I was hoping to end the video a nice and tidy story about a national park superlative, where I could tie things off with a nice little bow about how lucky we are to have protected places like this where we can bear witness to the astonishing feats of nature. But I'm afraid we can't turn a blind eye to the fact that Mount Rainier's record-breaking snows, and indeed those of the entire Pacific Northwest, are under threat. Climate change is, of course, the culprit. The National Park Service and others have been conducting extensive studies on this, and all indications are that temperatures are rising and snowfall is decreasing at Mount Rainier. The mountain is receiving more rain and less snow higher and higher up its slopes. Mount Rainier is actually the most glaciated peak in the contiguous United States. It's home to more than 29 named glaciers, replenished each year by snowfall, and yet these glaciers have shrunk in area by 41% since 1896, and by more than 4% just between 2015 and 2021. Just recently, the Stevens Glacier was demoted from even being classified as a glacier at all, instead being downgraded to a perennial snowfield. The snow that does fall is melting out much earlier in the season and much more quickly 
resulting in warmer streams and impacting the many plants and animals that rely on those snowmelt streams. The Park Service is also challenged to maintain the park's infrastructure in these conditions, as these earlier, more severe meltouts can bring with them colossal debris flows and floods. In 2006, one debris flow destroyed a grove of 100-year-old old-growth Douglas firs and caused damage to the West Side Road. The evidence is clear. If these trends continue, more than just snowfall records could be impacted in the future. We are talking about the degradation of entire ecosystems that the park protects, as well as impacts to our very own visitor experience. So instead of that nice and tidy little bow, I'll leave you with a reminder that our parks are fragile places, and that while we can and do visit them to bear witness to astonishing feats of nature, parks like Mount Rainier also serve as some of the most visible symbols of what we stand to lose in an era of anthropogenic climate change. Thank you so much for watching. This is my first real video of the year after my cliche things are changing video and my recap of my 2023 park travels. I was excited to dive back into educational videos, so that felt really good. This is National Park Diaries, a channel dedicated to telling educational documentary style stories about parks and protected areas from all around the world. If that's your thing, do consider sticking around and checking out some of my other videos. It's hard to believe that there are now over 100 of those for you to go back and watch. Patreon is also a big source of support for me. It helps smooth out some of the ridiculous volatility associated with making algorithmically selected content. I quite literally could not make these videos without my support over there, so I do appreciate all of you who support me on Patreon. You can also follow me on Instagram for park photos and to keep up with my travels, and it's also pretty much just like the easiest place to get in touch with me. That is all I have for you, so I'll see you next time. Goodbye.